Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for this webinar today presented by the National Pesticide Information Center. My name is Dave Stone. I'm an associate professor at Oregon State University's toxicology program, as well as our extension services, and I direct NPIC. NPIC is a cooperative agreement between the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and Oregon State University. Today, you'll be listening to a webinar entitled Incident Data from NPIC, How to Request It and What Can It Tell Us? This webinar is actually going to be de delivered by Casey Buell, a longtime project coordinator of NPIC and former pesticide investigator for the Oregon Department of Ag. Before I turn it over to Casey, I have a few logistics on the webinar to cover. To facilitate the flow of the webinar, we would appreciate if anyone who is actually calling in on the uh, uh, toll-free number to actually mute their line, either through the phone or by hitting star six. Uh, you can also listen to the webinar through your computer speakers, which will have a global mute on them. To facilitate the flow of the presentation, if you have any questions, please use the chat function, and at the end of the presentation, we'll go back and review the chat uh, questions that came in, as well as ask people to unmute their phones if they want to ask questions through the phone. We will be recording this webinar, so if you have any colleagues that wish to view the presentation in the future and were unable to attend, we'll send follow-up information on how to access the recording. Finally, I'd like to highlight that one of the services that NPIC provides for the public is to educate them about the role that your agency plays in the world of pesticides. If you wouldn't mind visiting our homepage sometime after the webinar and accessing our resource tool to ensure that we have the most up-to-date information from your agency, it would be greatly appreciated. So with that, I'll turn it over to Casey, and again, we'd like to express our thanks for joining us today. Yes, very much so. We really appreciate your time and your interest in um, obtaining data that we collect and catalog and correct with great care. So without further ado, let's look at the outline. All right, as, as an introduction, the kind of things that we're going to go over today, we'll start by just introducing our mission. For those of you that are not familiar with our information service, then we'll talk about who can request the data, what are some examples of data, what information do we collect for every incident, and how do we characterize those incidents. Finally, we'll talk about how we work so hard to ensure data quality. I'm hearing an echo. If you're using the phone line, can you make sure you've got it muted? Okay, it looks like the echo went away. Thank you. And finally, we'll finish up with how to request and pick data. So what is NPIC? It's an information service, primarily and most, uh, most yes. The toll-free phone service is available for four hours a day from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern, or on the Pacific Coast, 8 to noon. We're funded through a cooperative agreement, and we answer about 12,000 inquiries per year from a very diverse set of audiences. We provide science-based and bilingual information. We translate that technical information into words that people can understand, and we connect them with local resources when needed. Our website has over 700 pages in English and Spanish and receives over 5 million page views annually. Uh, we like to count page views because they represent real humans as opposed to hits. We leverage our interactions with the public to create appropriate publications, podcasts, and videos. So we take that experience interacting with people every day to create publications that make sense for our audience. We also document elements of each conversation and record categorized data in a custom database. None of the information is verified by independent investigation. We make no claims as to its accuracy or veracity other than that we have done our best to accurately reflect the information provided to us. So that's an important piece of understanding our surveillance data. It's not um, verified. But this is the information that people report to us, and we try to serve as a pane of glass and reflect that um, as accurately and concisely as we can. So who can request data? Lots of folks, actually. Um, EPA personnel and state agencies are able to request data with uh, no charge, and we deliver that data within two weeks. 
typically we actually deliver within one week, but we um, promise within two weeks. Now other folks can also request data from NPIC, but it goes through a very different process. Um, of course, there are some burdens associated with putting together complex data requests, so there is a fee uh, for organizations that don't already um, collaborate with us in formalized ways. So what will the data look like? Everything we collect about an incident will be provided to you. By policy, we do not collect personally identifiable information. That includes things like names, phone numbers, addresses, email addresses, anything that could be used to identify the individual. We just don't collect that stuff. Data can be provided in PDF if you like to browse through cases, essentially one case per page. Um, and that's a really handy way if you want to read everything in the report. But it can also be provided in CSV format, which can be viewed or sorted in Excel, or it can be imported into Microsoft Access. Um, we haven't heard about other database programs having it imported, but it's, um, it's very portable, and we would be happy to work with you. You can also request um, a custom format or ask for both, so you can um, take a look at the data in both ways. So example outputs, I want to tell you in general who's already requesting data from NPIC and what they're using it for. EPA personnel in several divisions have requested dozens of reports over time, and we're um, happy to provide those. All incidents related to an active ingredient, they can request all incidents related to an EPA registration number or specific product. States have also requested reports. For example, all incidents in the state for a given time period, and we'll pass those along. Those can be very useful in identifying outreach priorities. If you're hearing a lot about mothball incidents, for example, maybe it's time to do some outreach about proper use of mothballs. Another example might be all animal incidents related to flea treatments. We provided that report recently. Or something like a, a group of pesticides, rodenticides, or something similar. So there's a lot of ways that we can break it down and, and provide it. Another example output, um, some time ago, EPA Region 5 requested data from us regarding pesticide misuse, misapplications that were related to bed bug management in homes. And as a result, Region 5 partnered with ATSDR to publish a public health advisory alert. And several media outlets published articles about this uh, advisory. So it served a very important public health function um, to get the word out that misusing pesticides for bed bug control can present new hazards. Another example of the way that we can monitor data, um, this is an example we noticed just um, talking around the office that the, the types of incidents we heard um, about slug and snail control were changing, especially in 2008 and 2009. So we ran the data to look at animal incidents with both active ingredients that are primarily used for slug control, and we found a really interesting trend here. And that trend led to this publication in the Journal of the American Vet Med Association. So that's another example where the trend lines can be very helpful to educate, uh, in this case, veterinarians about the possibility for, for iron toxicosis in dogs, which had not been previously described in the United States. Another example, um, NIOSH recently, I guess a year or two ago, requested NPIC data regarding human exposures to dichlorvos pest strips. They combined that data with other cases from sensor programs in several states to build a broader picture of those incidents and they published an article to raise awareness educating the public and public health professionals about the legal proper uses for those pest strips and here's an example at the top you can see the MMWR that was published and an example of one of the articles that that came out about that from the Washington State Department of Health I think we have some of those folks on the line today um, and then that was carried further into other venues as, as an example into e-extension also published something based on that information and there were several other media outlets as well so this is just to go to an example of the kind of things that can be very useful when digging into this data. What else can it tell us? Um, what's being reported by the general public? That's a major strength of our data compared to other data sets, I think. Um, over 90% of our inquiries come from members of the general public. What circumstances are leading to exposures? So an example with um, the report for Region 5 looking at misapplications for bed bugs, um, much of that information isn't necessarily coded, but it's in the narrative. 
So even with very specific um, scenarios that you might be interested in investigating, our narratives are pretty strong to help you do that. How serious are those incidents? How many are being reported and is that rate changing over time? Is there a changing trend in active ingredient use? And another example are people asking questions about a topic. For example, we recently produced reports about questions received related to the Ebola outbreak. Specifically, people were asking us about antimicrobial products that may be effective against it. So that gives you a broad swath of the types of information that we can provide and what it can do for us. Now digging in to talk more about the data that we do collect, there are three types of inquiries. Um, we break them down into info, incident, or other. The type of inquiry um, determines the amount of information we collect, and I'm going to go into detail uh, and during this webinar. I know the folks that are, are dialed in are data people, so let's get into the <laughs> details of the data. We will do that. So as we start, for all inquiries, whether it's incident, information, or other, we aim to uh, collect the inquirer's zip code, the type of person, the type of questions they're asking. If they mention a product, we try to get that product name or the re EPA registration number. We really try to get the EPA registration number every time because it's the most reliable identifier of a product, but sometimes um, it is just not possible. We document the actions that we perform, if there were any referrals or transfers, for example. And we ask the person how they found our phone number. So we get an idea of how, what outreach is being effective. In the following slides, I'm going to show you um, each field that we collect in our database, and then I'll show you a 12-month snapshot. Now, I selected this um, time span, and I apologize here, it should say 2013, because it's the last 12-month period that we have an annual report finished. Um, our 2013 annual report was only for an eight-month period, so it's just a little bit weird. So we went back to the 12-month the mark. All right, to begin, these are the types of person that we document. 93% of those inquiries come from the general public. We still receive a notable number of inquiries from government agencies, medical professionals, veterinarians, environmental agencies, in the numbers of hundreds per year, but it's a small percentage overall. This is one of the strengths of our data, I think, that we are really dialed in with the residential market and what people in the um, general public are doing and thinking and asking. The types of question that we document are shown here. Um, there can be more than one type of question in an inquiry, and there often is. Sometimes a person will call in asking one question, and they, it, it leads to a story that leads to additional questions. So we try to document those as best we can. Now, in that 12-month chunk of time, here's what the, it looked like. And I know this may be too small to read, so I will um, list the top four bars. The top question that we receive is health. Anything related to the health of people, animals, plants, this is the basic risk type of question. Application questions came in second, and that means how do I apply the product? Very specifically, I'm not sure how to mix it. I'm not sure how to interpret this label statement, and that kind of thing. The third bar is other, and I can break that apart for you a bit. About a third of those are wrong numbers. About a third of those, again, are folks that are seeking their pest control company. They actually get on the line and think they're calling their pest control company because our phone number shows up on a lot of invoices, and we appreciate that when companies do that. And the other third are just off-the-wall questions that may not be related to pesticides, but they're often related to things like, you know, when should I plant this um, crop? at this time of year, or maybe fertilizer advice, and it just is outside the realm. And fourth, people ask us for pest control advice. How do I manage this specific pest? And in a lot of those cases, we can talk about IPM tactics, integrated pest management, and we also connect them with local resources like Extension. And the other examples here, just to list a few of them, people ask us questions like medical treatment, cleanup, and pick questions, questions about what we do. Sometimes they call us asking, you know, where to buy another bottle of whatever they have in their hands. And um, rarely, they call to report an incident. You'll see that down toward the end, um, 240 times in that 12-year period. And those are often cases where people have an adverse reaction in pets 
to a pesticide. There's several sites out there that direct people to report adverse reactions to NPIC, and we're happy to take those reports down. But typically, people are calling with questions about risk or application or pest control regulations, and 14% um, of the time or so, we hear about an incident. Moving forward, we do make a lot of referrals to other organizations if we're not able to address the question very specifically ourselves. We refer a lot to the manufacturer because they're the best resource to answer questions about how to interpret the label and how to apply a product specifically. And we refer to the NPIC website quite often, and county extension comes in third. When folks ask questions about how to control a pest, it's great to get in touch with someone local and find out what's working for their neighbors. Um, we also refer to poison control when folks are experiencing current symptoms. State lead agencies, is, we always bring them up when folks report something that might be illegal, including drift, misapplications by professionals, and so on. Toward that end, we maintain a huge database of contacts. We verify them every two years at the minimum, and we explain the roles played by these various agencies, extension, vector control agencies, um, EPA and which offices do what. And I think this is one of the, the key roles that we can play. Training on this is, is very um, arduous. There's a lot to know about what these agencies do and what they're capable of and we can serve as an interpreter for the general public and help connect them with the right people. So when you go to our website after this webinar, click on the, the map that you see. It looks like this. And when you go to your state, You'll be able to check the, our phone numbers, check our websites, and make sure that we've got it right for your state, or at least for your agency, and we would appreciate that. Moving forward, when we ask folks, where did you find our phone number? These three make up about three quarters of the answers. The product label is primary. Our, our phone number appears on a lot of uh, product labels for smaller registrants that may not have their own phone centers. People find us through the internet and through their pest control companies. And often when they find us through a pest control company, it's because our phone number shows up on their invoice. Now, moving forward into things that we only collect for incidents. This is how we define an incident. It's an unintended exposure, an intended exposure with an adverse effect, any spill or any misapplication. And you'll see in the pie chart here, about 14% of our calls are classified as incidents. Um, this year, it's actually closer to 18%. So it ranges somewhere in there. So the type of incident is recorded. If there is an exposure, we try to categorize the route of exposure, inhalation, dermal, ingestion, occupational. And if it's really hard to nail down, it might be exposure possible or unknown or maybe many routes of exposure. We try to also capture the timeline describing the exposure duration, the symptom onset, and resolution. Of course, that's when time is not of the essence. If someone needs to talk to poison control right away, then we make that referral and make sure that happens. But if there is time, we try to collect a lot of detailed information to help us um, use the data in, in positive ways. We collect age, symptoms, gender. If it's an animal, we collect the species, breed, and weight. So the types of entities exposed to pesticides, this is a summary again from the 2012 annual report, which is on our website. For human entities, they're about 50% women, 40% men, and 10% groups. When it's a group, of course, we can't categorize the gender. For animals, most of what we hear about are pets, 87% single animal. Sometimes we hear about groups, often groups of pets. A few times it might be groups of wildlife, or, I'm sorry, groups of livestock, and only rarely in 2% of those animal cases are we hearing about wildlife. This big chunk that is environment is mostly buildings and plants. If there was a misapplication to a building, it gets coded as an environmental entity. Uh, misapplications to plants are unfortunately common, especially in the summer, and we hear from folks on those issues. This kind of breaks down our environmental entities a little bit more. So the environmental entities are listed as the rows, agricultural crop, building, home garden, lawn, etc. And then what happened to those entities is listed along the top. 
The most common thing we hear about for environmental incidents are misapplications by the resident to the building or home, by far. There's a smattering of other things. There's also um, misapplications to the home lawn where the plant was exposed and might have been damaged. There's 141 of those. But this gives you a general idea. Spills in the building or home, we heard about 50 of those in 2012. Drift, only 14 in the building or home. But in, on the home garden, 27. So this gives you an idea of what, what data we have to share. For all incidents, we also aim to identify the location. And this slide is important to kind of dwell on for a moment. Um, I think this is also one of the strengths of our data, that most of the incidents we hear about happen in the home or yard. If you're interested in looking at an issue related to residential incidents, our data set is strong in that respect. We hear a smattering of other ones, but mostly, vastly, they're in the home or yard. Another strength of our data, and this isn't necessarily intended for you to read, but this is a, a very typical incident narrative. We aim to be concise and complete, which of course is a balancing act. Um, to be overly complete, you could write five pages about an incident, but it's, it just buries the critical information. So we work really hard on training to help specialists write a narrative that is specific, concise, and complete. Um, we can also do narrative keyword searches. So for example, we can look for the word bees, or we can look for the word tomato, um, and, and dig those things right out of the narrative, if need be. So keep that in mind, that it's not just the, the data points that we categorize and code for, but it's also this rich narrative that we have to draw from. Now, how do we characterize the reported symptoms? Well, we compare the symptoms to case reports, books, and other literature for the specific active ingredient involved. And we assign a severity, I'm sorry, a certainty index. Most of the time, it's probable, possible, or unlikely. And you can see how that broke down in the 2012 annual report for both humans and animals. It's just an estimate by NPIC as to whether those signs or symptoms were definitely, probably, possibly, or unlikely to have been caused by the reported exposure. So there's really only a certainty index when we have a human or animal that was impacted and those in that human or animal had symptoms and there was a known active ingredient. So there's not a certainty index on every incident. So um, like for a spill inside, there would be no certainty index. Hope that's clear. We can also narrow our, our, our reports by this. If you only want to see incidents that were classified as possible or greater, or possible, possible, probable, or definite, we can do that. We also assign a severity index. Anytime symptoms are reported for a human or animal. And we base those criteria um, on similar symptom systems used in other agencies. So for humans, uh, we adapted uh, the criteria that are used by the National Poison Data System. So um, yes, the poison control centers actually publish data in that respect. And the US EPA has a system for severity also in their incident data system. So we made ours so it would be compatible enough to be combined with other sources of data. For animals, the criteria were adapted from a similar mechanism used by the Animal Poison Control Center run by ASPCA. They also provide data requests, I believe. So what does the severity index look like um, in general? Well, thank goodness we're not hearing about a lot of major symptoms or deaths. The vast majority of deaths we hear about are in animals. Again, we hear a lot about adverse reactions to um, pesticides in pets. Um, but minor and moderate symptoms are reported most often. Now, in the next part of the presentation, I'm going to emphasize how hard we work to ensure data quality and just give you some of the highlights of how we do that. We have a facilitator for the PID. PID stands for Pesticide Inquiry Database. That's just the um, database we use to house all this information. And she makes corrections as needed to maintain a consistent approach. We do have seven or eight people that enter data, so of course one person has to look at consistency. Dr. Daniel Sudakin and Dave Stone provide input on human incidents, and Dr. Fred Berman, a veterinarian, provides input on the animal incidents. 
The coding support, we have references available to everyone, coding guidance provided by the PID facilitator verbally and by email. This is something that happens daily and weekly around the office in real time when something comes up. And um, one of those coding references is actually available um, within this webinar. Let's see if I can get my little arrow to show you. Over here, you'll notice there's a box with um, the 2012 log sheet and log coding guidelines. Those are documents that I think you can just grab right from the webinar and take a look at. Some people like to see what the log sheet looks like and the specific log coding guidelines, many of which we just went through. We also publish um, human incident reports and animal incident reports. So um, about once a month we get a report that comes out that shows any changes that were made in the QAQC process. And that way we can hopefully not make that same mistake again. In this example, the certainty index was changed from possible to unlikely because it was discussed with Dr. Sudeikin and he found that the irritant or contact dermatitis reaction in the skin should not last that long unless there's ongoing exposure. So the coding was changed to unlikely. These are some of the additional resources we have available to specialists to maintain that data quality over time. That picture of a gold phone is to represent our, our internal contest that we hold every um, couple of months where there's actually a competition on coding quality and the person who wins that gets to keep a golden phone on their desk for, until the next contest is held. Um, you can see just from the list, we have a list of commonly misspelled active ingredients, and it's important to get those right so that the data requests come out properly. Um, odor inhalation guidance, how do we categorize um, an inhalation exposure when the person reports an odor? So we've had to get very specific on these. We have procedures for just about every scenario we have come across. Another example, we do annual audits. No matter how long a person has been working here, they get feedback once a year very specific to their own performance and areas for improvement. Maybe they need to work harder to get um, ages for their human incidents um, or maybe they need to work harder to get a higher percent of zip codes and maybe they need to make their narratives just a little more concise. They'll get that kind of feedback in an annual audit and that's of course taken into account with their annual staff evaluation. This brings us to a very big question. Now that you know what kind of things we can record and do, you must be dying, I hope, to do a data request yourself. If you work for EPA, there's a request form on your intranet that you can easily fill out. And if you have trouble finding it or using it, there's the contact information for our project officer, Ana Rivera Lupianes, who I think is on the call. There's her phone number and email. Now, if you work for a state agency, we encourage you to just send us an email, and we put our email addresses right there. And the reason for that is that it's usually helpful to have some kind of conversation so we can build the best query to really dig out the data that you're most interested in. We'll talk about the date range that you're looking for, make sure to nail down any um, narrowing features that will make it the most positive um, report for you. So it's the beginning of a conversation when we get that email, but we still, um, deliver that within two weeks from, from your email. With that, we've come to the end of my presentation, but I know there are several questions that have been coming in, and we should address those in, uh, in an appropriate format. I think one of my colleagues has been um, writing things down. Yeah, um, thank you, Casey. Uh, at this point, if anyone has muted their phone and wants to unmute it to ask a question, please do, uh, but I'm gonna answer um, and, had, and asked for some help from Casey here to address the questions that came in from Timothy, I believe from Region 6. Um, the first one was, um, how, does EPA, how do the EPA regions get updates regarding pesticide health-related incidents on a press release? Uh, and the example given was the, the PET one. Um, there are First of all, when, when MPIC does this, we do it in coordination with, with uh, our project officer to let them know uh, what we're seeing. And so we'll typically post this on our website. But we are very interested in building uh, uh, stronger liaisons with all EPA regional, regional offices. And so um, if there's a mechanism we can put in place to improve communication so that when we see a trend or when um, uh, a highlight's going to come out from a certain region or a partnering organization, 
that uh, it, it's made sure to be uh, globally distributed. I, I'd certainly welcome that discussion and, and setting up that kind of process. Uh, so if there's any feedback on, on that uh, question that, or follow-up, uh, it's certainly something that, that uh, I'd like to be part of. Um, another question came in about, do we get data requests from tribes? Um, to my knowledge, I don't think we have received a data request from tribes, but we would welcome that. Yeah, we would, and we would actually treat it just like we would treat a uh, request from a state lead agency. Uh, there would be no uh, fee associated with that. Um, it would be uh, something that, that actually we, we, we uh, welcome uh, to put together. Um, then what came in, uh, several questions came in about uh, wildlife incident reporting. Um, we don't hear a lot about wildlife incidents. We have uh, invested quite a bit of time uh, working with uh, EPA, partic particularly EFED, in developing a um, online portal called the Eco Portal for um, collecting uh, incident, wildlife incident reports. Uh, it is underutilized, absolutely, particularly in comparison to our normal day-to-day -day work through our pesticide incident database, but also in comparison to the veterinary incident reporting portal. So when we hear a lot about animals, it is very much companion animals that we're hearing about. Dogs and cats primarily, not just dogs and cats, but, but primarily those. So we don't hear a lot about um, uh, wildlife incidents. Uh, and Nick's question was, why is that and what can EPA do to help us with that? Um, it's a great question. I, I probably have a, I don't have a satisfying answer because it's a head scratcher to me as well why uh, it's underutilized or why we don't hear more. Uh, EPA did a, a great outreach on this to um, all the right places, um, uh, and it, it just, it, it seems like there was a temporary uh, uptick in the number of reports that, that were occurring after the outreach, particularly from beekeeping uh, associations or beekeepers, uh, and since then it's, it's dropped back down. So, so it certainly is, seems to be an underutilized or underreported phenomenon that, that we hear about. Um, <clears throat> Let's see here. I can take the misapplication Yeah, question. do you want to take the next one, Casey? Sure. The question about misapplication is a very good one. In general, we have to have an EPA registration number so we can look at the exact label language and compare it to the application scenario that the caller described. When there's a clear mismatch, uh, we would code that as a misapplication. So, for example, the caller might tell us, oh my goodness, I accidentally sprayed my roses with a herbicide. That's a misapplication. Um, and we would need the EPA registration number in that case as well to, to compare that obviously roses are not an approved application site. There's a couple of exceptions. One is with mothballs. We know that mothballs are, are not allowed to be used outside of airtight containers. So even if we don't have an EPA registration number, if someone describes that use pattern, we'll code that as a misapplication. There's another weird one that just came up this week. Someone said their pest control company told them they um, over-applied a product. So we reflected that with the coding, that we take them at their word. If the applicator says he misapplied it, he misapplied it. So um, I hope that answers the question about misapplication. Let's see. Region 6, thank you. Yeah, OPP Weekly is a great idea. Uh, we have in the past uh, worked to use that quite a bit for, for programmatic updates. Uh, and then uh, I think that would be a great um, mechanism that I'll, I'll definitely work with our project officer, Anna, about to see about uh, highlighting trends and other things that, that come to our attention in the OPP Weekly. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Um, by the way, before we answer the next question, um, I, I do want to uh, just reiterate for the, the folks that joined us late into the webinar that this is being recorded uh, and that we will post it and we'll send out follow-up information about how to retrieve the posting so you can view it in its entirety. Thank you. So, um, Gabriella's next question. What are the key areas in which EPA should be doing more outreach and education? That's a great question. Um, there's a couple of key things. Of course, label comprehension is, is a constant problem with members of the general public. Folks have sometimes literacy challenges, language challenges. Sometimes big blocks of text are just intimidating, especially if those blocks of text has a lot of numbers in it. 
So um, label comprehension exercises and outreach would be most welcome. Of course, outreach and education related to IPM tactics that can sometimes eliminate the need to use pesticides in, a, in some cases. That's also helpful for risk reduction. Um, and I think the, the message still isn't out there that the label is the law. So of course, that one is an important thing as well. There's probably more, but I should move on to the next question. And I'll give that one some more thought, Gabriella. Thank you. Donald Baumgartner asks, does NPIC report alleged incidents to state lead agencies? No, we do not. When someone reports an incident to us that re is related to a potential violation of the law, and we're familiar with FIFRA on the federal level, less familiar with specific state regulations, we explain the role of the state lead agency. If you want to have this investigated, and it sounds like you do, you have to call your state lead agency, and I can give you their phone number right now. You know what you're going to ask them. Make sure you ask for this. Make sure you ask for that. So we direct them to make that phone call independently, provide their own name and phone number, and tell their story personally from, from their mouth to the state lead agency. But I can't emphasize enough that we really do educate folks about the role of the state lead agency and provide their phone numbers, websites to the best of our ability. Um, if someone is seeking to have something investigated, that is the very first thing that, that comes out as a referral. If, um, yeah, I don't need to go down that road. So what's the next one? Um, why frame key need for, okay, I'll wait for that to be finished. Um, and if anyone has a question over the phone, please, please chime in. Uh, I, I think, I think uh, we've unmuted everything. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. Well, I'm really looking forward to working with so many of you. I'm really gratified to see that we had over 90 people attend. I know there's many people in some of those rooms. And I'm looking forward to collaborating with so many of you to really um, utilize this data that we work so hard to um, make sure that it's collected and documented accurately. The more it gets used, the happier we will be. So um, we're very excited to see the, the interest. Now, it looks like Washington State has an, a, a question. Uh, Okay. Outreach and education by EPA as label comprehension rather than also focus on the label itself in terms of what manufacturers put on the label and how large appropriate um, is to a reader. That's a good point. I mean, there's work to be done on improving labels and there's also work to be done on emphasizing the importance of label comprehension and then how to do it as well. I think there's work to be done in both respects. You're right. We do hear a lot about people complaining the text is just too small. I cannot read it. Um, so we're very patient with folks if they need to go get some reading glasses or a magnifying glass, which happens every day around our offices, um, so that they can at least find the registration number so we can pull up the label and talk with them about it. But of course, in that case, we have to tell them we may be looking at different versions of the label. And if that's the case, then um, chatting with someone in your state lead agency who has access to the state version of the label is the only way to be sure. But it, it's, it's awkward sometimes. That's true. Looks like there's another question from Johan. Is the PowerPoint available on our website? It absolutely will be. It's not yet. Um, but the link will be distributed just as soon as we can get it posted. And I'm so glad that you guys are interested to collect it. Now, a lot of the data that we went through, the very um, detail-oriented slides, that information is available right now on our website in the form of our annual reports. If you went to our website and put in the search box, annual report, it would take you to a page that lists all of our annual reports going back to 1995. And each one of those data points is, is shown in clear detail. Our annual reports are very detailed. So if you want to just browse and see what you can um, tell from browsing, the annual reports are a great place to start. OK, uh, any other uh, questions from the group um, before we um, sign off from the webinar and uh, let you go on to your busy schedules? If not, um, you've got uh, both Casey and I's email up there. You know how to reach NPIC. We hope to hear from everybody uh, and, and uh, really enjoy uh, working in uh, this, this world of pesticides and, and with the, the excellent professionals that are out there 
uh, every day on the front lines of regulation and public health and enforcement and education. So uh, with that, uh, thank you very much. And uh, we hope that uh, to hear from you soon. Yes, indeed. Thank you.